All right, good afternoon to you. Um, I'm now going to break the first rule of uh, speaking at a conference and contradict the chair. Um, and I'm going to break it at the beginning, which is an even worse way of doing it, which is to say, uh, I just need to correct, I, I'm, I'm no longer head I'm of sorry. information. No, no, no. Google um, uh, gave me the wrong Google information. Google gave me the wrong information. <laughs> um, I was, uh, um, uh, until uh, last year, uh, head of information policy for Mars, which is indeed in charge of data protection and freedom of information. The reason I, I, I point this out is because, uh, well, twofold. Um, firstly, that we're the BBC and we like accuracy. Um, and, and secondly, because I've uh, left that behind, and I'm now sort of reflecting upon that 10 years of leading that team. I've been working on big data, which actually I'll come back to and refer to uh, in a moment or two. Um, but I'm soon going to be leaving uh, the BBC, and so um, most of what I say today is, is going to be my personal reflections upon this as I move out into uh, a new era, still sticking, I hope, uh, in the privacy sphere. Um, firstly, a couple of points, and I promised uh, uh, to David that I wouldn't spend um, too long in this section reflecting too much on the last session um, uh, around a, a media response. I, I do think there are just two things I would say um, uh, in terms of um, the Article 29 Working Party um, response as opposed to how Google is implementing it. From a, a, a media perspective, um, we think that there are some problems with the Article 29 Working Party and indeed sometimes the way it is implemented uh, by Google. There is an issue around transparency um, and I think that continues to be an issue and it's something that actually I'll pick up on, reflect on my own personal views uh, in a moment. Um, if, uh, the if the publisher doesn't know, and the Article 29 Working Party suggests that in most circumstances the publisher does not need to know that the URL has been taken down, then actually how can Google be making uh, a properly informed judgment? There may be issues that the data subject has raised which the publisher has counters to. Those facts need to be known. There isn't a balance there. And this comes then to the data subject. The data subject has the right to appeal, but the publisher doesn't under the Article 29 Working Party because the publisher isn't appealing under the Data Protection Act or under the directive. Again, there's an imbalance. And I'd like to come back to this point about balance going forward because I do think, actually, we are in danger of of regulating and legislating in silos and ignoring the fact that there are other silos that are significant and have impact in this area. Um, also, I just think that I think there's a, a slight danger. Wilhelm uh, suggested there has never been a problem of censorship, except as in the vast majority of uh, territories, um, the publishers are not being informed that the reality is being taken down. We don't know whether there's a problem of censorship because the publishers don't know that it's happened. That is, in essence, a societal problem that I think we need to tackle. And it's back to this point. You can't have a fundamental right being judged unless you actually are balancing it. So that's the BBC position. Now, um, this is all down to me. So uh, when I get the rest of it wrong, you can just shout at me instead. Um, uh, I do think I'm nervous of data protection authorities being the, the bodies given the responsibility to make this balance. Particularly reflecting upon freedom of expression, uh, section 32 in the DPA, and more broadly. Data protection authorities are there to enforce a fundamental right. They're a very important part of the mechanisms. But they're there to enforce one right. How can a body that's set up to enforce a right then balance other rights that it has no responsibility for? When I said this to a, an audience uh, in, in Brussels recently, a member of Keneal said, well, we, we deal with all sorts of industries all the time, very, very important industries. We can do all sorts of balances. Yes, you deal with every industry, pretty much. There are very few industries, perhaps apart from chicken rearing, that doesn't involve personal data. Why I came up with chicken rearing, I don't know. But, anyway. <laughs> um, but I do think that there is, there is essentially a problem here that, that actually um, I'm not sure a regulator for one right is the appropriate body to be balancing other rights. Uh, Eduardo from the second panel and I have uh, absolute agreement here. Um, we don't, I, I don't think that actually Google is a data controller. Now, I take Chris's point. If it's not a data controller, what is it, etc.? 
Well, my answer to that is, at the least, when it comes to the new regulation, they had to put something in that makes sense in the modern world. But, oh, no, it's a bit too late to start. So we've got a mainframe idea being translated into the new regulation, which will be Web 2.0. Frankly, the idea that it's up to date is ridiculous. But the data controller has certain implications. How do you do a subject access request to Google? Well, I suppose you type your name in. <laughs> but data minimization? I don't know about you, but I don't want a search engine that does data minimization. Surely the point is it's meant to go out and find stuff. If it was data minimization, I could do that myself. So there are contradictions. And we're back into this disconnect between the law and reality, which has been mentioned already. Now, I do actually think, by the way, that um, uh, I was accused in that same panel of, of not being in favour of privacy. I've been the BBC's data protection officer for 10 years. I believe passionately in this stuff. But I do think there has to be a balance. And I think while that balance comes will be in the pragmatic. Yes, of course, we probably can't get rid of the concept of data controllers and data processors or introduce a third group, which would seem to be the sensible thing to do, in the new regulation. We'll be stuck with it. But the pragmatic solutions have to, affect the real, have to reflect the real world. My other problem with the judgment... And this is also true in, uh, there's a case which I don't think has been mentioned so far today, Telecarbel, uh, an Austrian case which went to the EUCJ, where what we have is what I think is a very dangerous pattern of the courts and society, uh, I don't just blame the courts here, but the courts and society effectively outsourcing judgments. We said to Google, it's, actually, there's a lot of really difficult stuff to balance here. You know, there's freedom of expression, there's personal rights, there's all sorts of things. You go away and do it, because we haven't got time in the courts and we want to spend the money. Getting a commercial organisation, however well-meaning, I like William, I know William very well, I think he does a terrific job. But should he be doing this job? I question that. Telecarpel has basically been told to go away and sort out IP infringement in Austria. Yeah, good luck with that. But why are we doing this? Well, because actually we don't have a mechanism to deal with it accurately ourselves. We can't get David to do it. He's got enough on his plate already. So it seems to me that, that as a society, we're making, um, uh, we're making more and more calls upon groups to do things because actually we haven't got the resource to do them ourselves and sort it out ourselves. And I think that's a dangerous route to go down. So there's this balance point. I do promise I'll talk about the other internet players, because I do think it's quite important. And this is where this balance point, I think, comes back. Um, I'll come back in a moment if I've got time to media archives. But social networking, online forum, the blog, point, the blog post. Some of you may know a, a case um, the, on, on the freedom of information side of my former life about sugar. Um, sugar versus the BBC, which was how widely do you define German and Martin literature? What is the definition now? That was in relation to the freedom of information, but clearly the same phrase appears in uh, the uh, Data Protection Directive and in the DPA. And when you look at nearly all of the jurisprudence there, it is told, we are told to interpret it widely. And yet there's a contradiction here, because we're also told to interpret the data protection widely. So we've got these two wide definitions which overlap in the middle. And I don't think we've really got our heads around this. The right to be forgotten, I think, does, as, um, uh, as uh, David has suggested, apply to a large number of internet players here. I don't think it's just um, search engines. I think the blog post is one example. I think social networks, online forums. But we're not even thinking far enough ahead. I've been think doing some thinking around IPTV, uh, in this last year, looking at big data and internet protocol television. Once your television set is effectively a computer, search is not going to be something you sit and type in. You're going to talk to your television set. I mean, sometimes you do that anyway, but that's normally shouting. <laughs> doesn't quite the same thing. You're going to say, get me the news. Whose news? What news? There will be an algorithm. It will probably be constructed by the set manufacturer. It will be Samsung's news algorithm. Will we know that actually the section from La Vanguardia or from the New York Post or whatever has been removed? No, we don't. 
And I do think that although, uh, as Julia in the first sec uh, second session said, this is statistically insignificant, yes it is. The number of major news items that might be removed is going to be statistically insignificant. But socially, I would contend, it is massively significant. And I think we have to be careful about wandering along this line and again forgetting the balance. This is Article 8 versus Article 10, or if you want the Charter, 7 and 8 versus 11. And I think these are not, not be, these are not incompatible. I think there can a balance can be made, but I would contend at the moment that the, the two sets of arguments are being put in opposition and are not actually being balanced. I um, uh, suggested something akin to this uh, in Europe, and, and, and it was suggested that somehow I, I hadn't read the judgment. <laughs> I've read the judgment. <laughs> I would contest putting the word balance in a judgment does not make a judgment balanced. <laughs> now, um, you know, uh, I, I freely accept that um, coming into a, a room full of lawyers, that's a dangerous statement to make. But I do think, actually, it's important. I think there wasn't enough balance made. And I think that's because, actually, to be fair to the ECJU, the reality was that they had to make a call on that set of circumstances. Were they going to really open, lift up the rock of freedom of expression at the same time? I don't think they'd have been finished now. So we've got over here the right to publish, and we've got over here the right for the individual. Well, that's fine, but we're going to have to bring them together. And we're going to have to do that sooner rather than later, I would contend. Um, I've already said that I think this is sort of um, a, a directive for the mainframe, the regulation Web 2.0, and I think we aren't going fast enough to look at the future. The direction of travel has been mentioned by David, the culture point. I actually am concerned about the direction of travel, not just because I think freedom of expression is being, being under, underweighted in this, although I do, but I also think that it's going to create further and further problems. The harmonisation point that the, the regulation is pushing towards is going to make this more difficult. We already have the majority of uh, companies, or large companies in this space, the American companies, not under genuinely not understanding where we're coming from. These are people for whom the First Amendment is absolutely ingrained. We're going to make all those conversations significantly harder now, that's not a problem in itself, and I don't think that that should be a reason for not doing it. But actually, if you start thinking in a globalised world, I do think that we are in danger of having a conversation with ourselves rather than the rest of the world. You then back to what is and is not appropriate inside individual territories inside Europe. For those of you who don't know it, look up the Wikipedia case in Germany where, um, I, now for the life of me, can't remember the name of the case, but effectively two people who were convicted of the murder of an actor went to Wikipedia, tried to get their names removed from the Wikipedia article about that actor. They didn't deny they'd done the murder, they didn't deny anything about it, they just said they wanted to get on with their lives. Again, a perfectly reasonable balance to be had. <coughs> but actually, there is an element, then, of rewriting history. And we have, as a society, to work out what we want to do about this. When we come to these new media players, does a blog post, when does a blog post, trip over into what I would call the casual vacancy effect? I don't know whether you saw the, sort of, uh, the, the dramatisation, but uh, for those of you who didn't, one of the things was a scurrilous website, but was sort of telling the truth. I get very nervous. I heard earlier today, we were talking about, you know, sort of, well, those circumstances where defamation or inaccuracy, well, actually, what's one, what's the other? My background before I got into privacy was as a political journalist. My exit from the BBC will be running an OB for the general election. I'm, I'm sort of being let loose with the toy cupboard again. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. But when you try and apply those kind of absolutes that only the law can in court when you look at the full set of facts and you try and say, we're going to do this on the fly. We're going to do this. We're going to outsource it to commercial companies and we're going to have, or we're going to have poor old David again at the uh, ICO deciding whether that is an inaccurate uh, statement. 
I don't think that is appropriate. And I think we've got to get that balance right. So I've only got about one minute left, I think. One minute? Oh, God. Yeah. Um, is there a way around that? Yes, I think there is, pragmatically. Um, what I've been doing for the last year is preparing a thing called My BBC, which is going to be going live in the autumn, and is actually about personalization. The only way you can work personalization is by getting a large amount of data about people. You can do that. You can take people on board. I genuinely believe you can make big data privacy friendly. I think they are in the process of doing so. But we're even there. Even when you do do it pragmatically, you're going to end up with some further conversations which we need to be having. What about exhaust data? What about data that you don't even know you've created just by wandering around the internet? Is that your personal data? It could describe you in certain circumstances. How do you define when it's going to be, um, uh, going to be um, uh, put into an anonymized form? Created data. The data that is going to be created by services for you at your request in order to supply you those services. Is that still personal data? Where does the algorithm itself become personal data? These are issues that need to be tackled, and I do think that we need to look at them, but we need to look at them in terms of the balance of the privacy right, which is vital, but some of the societal benefits that the, that the individual and society can gain by having that privacy right notched down or notched up. But we need to have the conversation, we need to have it in a broad sense, and we can't just have it in terms of a single judgment. Thank you.